Anger by Alexander Augustus Narrated by Daniel Collard Volume 1, Chapter 3 It had been nine years and ten months since Elizabeth's transformation at Shell Labs. The entirety of Scotland was now renamed the Garden of Shells in order to deal with the capacity of pearls, and the boundaries were expanding day by day as the pearls freely dug, flew, slithered and wheeled themselves across the rest of the British Isles. Pearls were fabled among the key workers to be indestructible, but regardless of the truth of this, Legislation ensured severe penalties for any human who demonstrated intent to harm them. As key politicians applied to transform into pearls, more and more responsibilities of the British government were absorbed into the Department of Posthumanism, which was answerable to the Board of Shell Corps. Elizabeth was sometimes amused to hear Edward Snippet's name thrown around in media discussions of this administration, a man who always successfully nestled himself beside a seat of power. It seemed that he had successfully made himself useful to Shell Corps. The remaining human population fell broadly into two categories. Those who aspired to ascend to the Garden of Shells as pearls, and those who wanted to remain human. They were labelled Remain and Leave, and the two crowds split largely down class lines. The affluent revered the whimsical life of leisure which the Garden of Shells offered, and hoped to pay their way into the programme. Celebrities and politicians led the way with televised red carpet approaches to the lab gates and theatrical reveals of their new bodies. Most disappeared into nature, but some crossed the garden borders and returned to society. Some lingered in places of cultural or historical significance, which were reminiscent of their achievements in former lives. These shells took care to observe, or guard, buildings, monuments and relics, like alien ghosts stalking the glory of their own pasts, unable to fully let go of who they had been. Among them, Boris Johnson transformed into a bionic jellyfish creature live on TV, and was now known to squirt his way through the streets of London, coveting his former offices as mayor and prime minister. Some labelled him the Pearl of the People, as he often followed groups of people around, seeking attention and approval. Many lower-income citizens also revered the Garden of Shells and, lacking in economic leverage, took key worker jobs which allowed them to enter the Shell Lottery. The prize allowed one worker to transform into a pearl every Thursday in a live televised event. Key workers' roles were the only human jobs of the future and incurred huge waiting lists, with rigorous psychological and physiological evaluations to endure in order to apply. Successful applicants were trained to form a skeleton government, tasked with the maintenance of the garden, maintaining foreign relations, and operating the shell program machinery, amongst other things. Fewer workers in the academic subjects, the arts and high-end services were needed, as more of the affluent philanthropists joined the mass exodus of the human body. Universities and other education systems soon vanished, along with the middle classes, the whole operation of society rested on an assurance of obedience from the key workers, which was increasingly enforced by a military presence. As only a small amount of energy was needed to maintain the humans in the work training camps, swathes of unnecessary areas were cut off from the national power grid, and nature flourished as a green corridor swept the length of the country. Elizabeth grew concerned for those left behind, but also for herself. Her joy was dependent on the human remainers. Autumn 2040. The sunset was toxic pink. Fragile golden flames flickered and tiptoed along the edges of the heavy evening clouds, wet and on fire. Bitter cold froze all the metal street lamps into giant flycatchers, warm amber glow beckoning closer, but dangerous for any wandering tongue. Elizabeth had spent several days waiting inside an ATM. It was somewhere in North London, 
an area not designated as essential. The buildings here stood grandly, tubby stone babies clambering across the facades, spilling cornucopias of fruit all over the empty streets. Inside, the once great interiors had been gutted and stripped. Back in the boom days, profit-hungry developers had come in to split the spaces up and rent them out. Grand halls were divided by flimsy plasterboard walls, strewn with plastic notices about fire regulations, and cork boards pulverised with pinned community notices. Little cubicles for offices and small capsules for homes. The building across the road from the ATM was exactly like this. The whole place reeked of damp polystyrene. Elizabeth meditated on the vacant space. Such rich exteriors, such impoverished interiors, quite unsatisfactory indeed. Suddenly, she sensed hurried footsteps in high heels speeding towards the ATM from a side alley. A short middle-aged woman sprung out like a cuckoo from a clock. She wore a low-grade hazmat suit, the plain white government issue type, though she had attempted to draw on some designs of her own. With purse in one hand, she popped open the hinge of her mask with the other and adjusted a pair of oversized plastic sunglasses before snapping it shut again. A nylon scarf was tied around the fiery ginger bob of her hair, which was a wig. The woman poked, 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 pokey poked at the ATM screen. Enter. With a great jolt, Elizabeth was snatched up with mechanical accuracy, spun around and spat out between the teeth of the slot. As Elizabeth was bundled into a wad with a dozen other notes, she noticed that the woman had neglected to wear any protection for her hands, presumably to avoid damaging her long red acrylic nails. Elizabeth was organised quickly between the pointed fingernails of the lady, folded into a printed letter and slipped into an envelope. The woman hurried across the road into a courtyard, underneath a stone arch with a growling lion keystone. She typed a code into a small box and entered the building. Elizabeth could feel damp all around her, the type that used to seep into her bones and make her knees ache. As a child, cold days like this called for a cosy up in front of a roaring fireplace, thawing out with a cup of hot chocolate. These pleasant memories were interrupted as the woman took a sheaf of envelopes from a pouch in her suit and pushed one through a letterbox. Quickly clacking steps as she went down the hallway, another envelope posted, and another. Her gait lunged up and down as she ascended a staircase and turned a corner. Another hallway, another staircase, and another. The place got shabbier as they went up. Eventually, Elizabeth in her envelope was lifted from the dwindling sheaf and slipped under the door of an apartment without a letterbox. The woman clacked away as fast as she had come. Elizabeth was alone. There was no roaring fireplace inside. The interior was colder than the weather was. An icy draught whistled through a gap in the largest window, across the single room to the front door. From within the envelope, Elizabeth surveyed the miserable little bedsit. In the centre of the room stood four horses, galloping furiously, with spiked manes and wild eyes. Astride each horse was a headless skeleton. Although decapitated, these figures wore piles of crowns atop their bony necks, which were chained back down to the horses themselves. Each horse stood around a metre tall, and were at various stages of completion. One was cast bronze, and gleamed with a brilliant white patination. The others were sculpted from wax, plastic, wood, nails, buttons, and an assortment of other scavenged treasures which seemed to be pinned, nailed, chained, and glued together. Not yet cast, but surely destined to become as brilliant as the first. A cracked plastic clock hung on the wall with its batteries exposed. It ticked five seconds, stopped, and then sped forward four as if to make up for the lost time. The floor was flung with mountains of unorganised clothes. A desk in the corner was impeccably neat. Elizabeth could not sense any family photos, but there were pages of detailed illustrations, pinned and tacked to the walls, fluttering in the draught like monochrome moths. There were no wardrobes to contain the heaped clothes, nor any TV, console or any other luxury. Nothing comforting, and nothing familiar. Elizabeth lay in wait. The hours came and went, and so too did the scuffling rats crawling in the air vents. 
Every now and then, she felt a parade of pearls glide through the sky above the building. In the distance, she heard the wailing sirens of a security hovercar. Then she felt footsteps pounding toward the building. They came faster, faster. A young man, slim with a small head of bushy hair, clutching at some kind of object. He was a crouched figure, skittering along purposefully with his shoulders hunched, led by the sensitive point of his nose. He was stalking, or being stalked. He raced down the street and slipped like a shadow under the arch with the lion keystone into the courtyard of Elizabeth's building. She felt the young man fold himself into a recessed doorway and, once hidden, pull the object out from under his jacket. It was a bejeweled rod, like a scepter, just over a foot long and formed of two twisting crystal parts mounted with gold and pearls. On top of the scepter was a crown with alternating fleur-de-lis and cross embellishments. Elizabeth knew it well. Oh my! The boy has the mayoral crystal scepter! She trilled in amazement. Whatever could he want with such an object? He slid it into his backpack, eyes glancing about wildly. He was buzzed, simultaneously beaming and grimacing as he laboured to quell maniacal laughter. With the scepter stowed out of sight, he leaned back against the wall. He slowed his breathing, calming the blood pulsing through his veins. The young man continued to wait in the recess, his pointed ears flexing at every sound. He was like a fox, hiding from a hound it knows has caught its scent. Every now and then he popped his head out to check if anyone was coming, if anyone had followed. The sirens faded away into the distance. Still, the young man waited. Sure enough, his instinct proved correct. Elizabeth felt another someone approaching, but in a far more blundering way. It was not a human creature. The boy had been followed by a pearl. Elizabeth fluttered with excitement and strained to tune into the vibrations from the courtyard, eager to see what was going on. The pearl was a globular form, a jellied orb with hard moving and clicking parts inside. The core was made of something like metal and bone, rotating and intersecting with itself. But the outer gel was encased in a permeable membrane and slopped about like a used condom. The smell was putrid. The whole thing stank of sewage. The specimen burbled like a drunk, vibrating uncomfortably. Elizabeth felt she recognised the gelatinous see-through body from previous encounters, but then again, most of the shells who chose to live among humans had some experience of celebrity. She guessed that for many, notoriety proved hard to let go of, even in the afterlife. The young man was obviously hiding from this pearl, whoever it was, as it blundered along the street, pursuing the stolen scepter. The pearl rolled on down the street without stopping at the courtyard, and it seemed the young man had successfully evaded discovery. With a grin, he muttered, I have some things against thee. He knew who the pearl was all right. He popped his head out from the recess once more and peered out under the lion keystone in the archway. He stared up at the lion's bared teeth for all of thirty seconds before stepping back into the courtyard. Something shiny caught his eye, so he knelt down and inspected it with swift, bird-like movements. It was a foil chocolate wrapper. He held it up to his left eye, exhaled and discarded it. He walked carefully through the courtyard, avoiding the cracks in the pavement and stepping over the metal plates of the fire hydrants, continuing to scan the floor as he walked. He put the code in the little box and stepped inside the building. Pausing outside a door on the ground floor, he listened for noise, looked left, looked right, and reached up over the doorframe, gently taking a key from some crevice notched within the faux wooden pediment. Elizabeth was gripped by his performance. It reminded her of a magician producing a solid object from thin air. His ears twitched comically as he listened again for anyone passing by. His eyes narrowed as he peered at the gap in the door. Slowly up, slowly down. And there, he found it, a strand of hair stuck between the door and the frame. Satisfied that the apartment had not been disturbed, 
he unlocked the door and slipped inside. He opened a kitchen cabinet and rotated cans to read their labels. He selected three, slipping them into his bag and rearranging the others to evenly cover the vacant space. He rotated them back to their original orientations so they might go unnoticed. Elizabeth felt that he handled everything as though it were a precious egg which could break on impact. Curious boy, she thought, with growing warmth. Now he turned to the window. He crouched down on hands and knees so that he would not be spotted from the courtyard, and inspected a number of leaves which had been severed from a money plant and placed on the windowsill. He held them in front of his sharp little nose. Two of the leaves had grown roots. He popped these into his pocket and left the rest on the windowsill. He crept back to the hallway, clicked the apartment door shut and replaced the key. He plucked another strand of hair from his head, licked both ends and placed it between the door and frame. He breathed a deep, satisfied sigh. No longer feeling the need to be careful, he pulled his shoulders back and stretched out, almost doubling in size, his face animated with open mouth and bared teeth. With surprising vigour, he bounced up four flights of stairs, jangled his keys and flipped the lock on the apartment. He threw the door open, propelling the envelope containing Elizabeth across the room. Whee! She cried. Elizabeth loved that type of motion, spinning around like a regal whirligig. The man's presence brought life to the room. Elizabeth's envelope was knocked out of sight under the corner of a mat. She tried to identify her curious host. Elizabeth quite liked the company of men. She missed her outspoken husband, Philip, even his brash remarks which used to cause so much bother with the press. If I were reincarnated, I would wish to be returned to Earth as a killer virus to lower human population levels, he once told reporters. Oh, the irony, Elizabeth chuckled, remembering it now. Who knows? Perhaps he got his wish? The young man tapped his pockets and said, Phone, money, keys. Took two steps forward and stalled paced back to the door and tapped his pockets once more, slowly reciting. Phone, money, keys. Everything was present, nothing lost in the chase. The Holy Trinity, he said to himself in a careful and pronounced voice. Elizabeth felt sincerity as he spoke, but protested inwardly, you just opened the door with your keys, so how might you lose them so soon afterwards? She decided he had the tendencies of a silly boy. Luckily for him, Elizabeth quite liked silly boys, even though she tried to hide her affection with her sensible demeanour. His mind was still elsewhere. Oh! he exclaimed. And ID! He tapped his back pocket and pulled out a passport. Always forget ID. He threw all four articles on the bed. Phone, money, keys, and ID. The young man shook off his bag, and then his jacket. The jacket was light and thin, probably some synthetic material, and certainly not adequate to protect against this cold, not to mention the filthy air. Young men all think they are invincible, Elizabeth thought. It occurred to Elizabeth that the boy had not been wearing any protective clothing at all, his home was a mess, except for the desks where he worked. It was as though all the care in his life was poured into his work, to the detriment of all else. The boy walked to the four horses and whispered sweetly to them while inspecting each one, running his fingers across their waxy surfaces. He lifted the cast bronze one with some difficulty to the desk. He took a metal skull-shaped key from his pocket and stuck it into the crown pile neck of the cast bronze skeleton. Now it had a strange head of sorts. One down, three left, until... Good night! He cried, waving his arms about. He lifted the metal horse with some difficulty from the table and placed it away from the others. Clank! Elizabeth felt something heavy move inside the horse. The man froze like a block of ice. Curious, thought Elizabeth. Does he fear what's inside the horse? He stood back, 
sighed, and glanced at his rucksack. The boy rubbed his hands together and burrowed through the bag like a scavenging animal. The bag was full of treasures. You mangy little fox, Elizabeth scoffed. He pulled out a plastic pack of ham and studied the nutritional values. He read aloud, Worker supplies. Reformed ham, cured with honey and cooked with less than 15% added water. He ripped the pack open and with bare hands lifted the first slice, methodically ripping the flesh along the grain of the meat so that neat sections came off, gnashing and swallowing with a red tongue and twitching lips. Systematically, he demolished the pack. Following this, he tore into three muffins, a can of tuna, shoveled down some slimy raw mushrooms, and set the other items to one side. Silly dustbin boy, have some manners, Elizabeth thought, lying eavesdropping under the rug. From the bag, the young man removed the glittering scepter. He inspected it with loving appreciation and placed it on top of a pile of treasure in the corner of his room. He's been busy, Elizabeth thought. The inflamed clouds outside had been snuffed out and left the room in darkness. The boy flicked a light on. Well, he does have electricity, even if the heating is out. Elizabeth sighed. He had evidently done a lot of the wiring himself. Cables and connectors were strung precariously around the walls like messy hair. Each light hung from a hook so he could move them around the room as he worked, but this meant shadowy replicas of himself were cast like a dark army across every surface, moving as he did. Every now and then he would reach out and sketch the line of his own silhouette. She worried that he was not looking after himself very well. He had the smooth skin of a baby's face, but the deep bags under his eyes betrayed a sad exile from childhood. Late twenties, she guessed. She felt the vibrations as he moved from one side of the room to the other. Don't tread on me, you daft boy! Elizabeth cackled. The man flicked the kettle on, and as it hissed, he pulled a sheet of paper from a pile on the floor, pinning it to the wall. He measured its angle with a spirit level. He drew. Nimble fingers dexterously plotted points and struck confident lines without hesitation. Elizabeth was mesmerized. She felt the strokes cut through her. She felt what he was drawing. Each stroke of the pencil produced shoots of excitement, as if the nib was being pressed against her own skin. This went on for several minutes, as he looked from the paper to the horses and back to the paper. Eventually, the man stood back, dropped the pencil and went into the bathroom, which was more like a rotting cupboard with a shower and a sink, stinking of egg and damp. He took a gulp of water from the tap, lapping with his tongue as his ears flexed back. There was a clump of fungus growing from a crack in the wall by the shower, which he had evidently not the impetus to remove. He was in some way quite unlike the other people Elizabeth had met on her journey. It seemed like everyone was scrambling for lifeboats on the Titanic, while this boy seemed intent on playing around in the wreckage, running up and down the corridors as they filled with water. Back at his desk, he worked into the bleak hours of early morning. The man was nodding now, weary and drooping. Every so often, there came a clicking and ticking from the belly of the bronze horse. He would jerk up, regarding the horse with a nervous stare. Finally, he spoke, addressing the bronze itself. White horse, are these pearls the harbingers of a fake peace? Elizabeth was surprised at how articulate his speech was. Somehow, she wouldn't have been surprised if he had barked and growled rather than use well-formed words. He flicked the light off and asked the darkness. What to do? with all this anger, outwards or inwards. White horse, with the sword between your teeth, once so full of fury, do you point the blade outwards or inwards? <coughs> <coughs> the man coughed a terrible cacophony, doubling over and hacking up some dark fluid from within himself. He brought his hand to his mouth, trembling, and inspected the blood. Elizabeth could hear in that cough a clogging deep within his body, an infection or abscess. He was ill, 
perhaps dying. And what if I choose to slip away harmlessly by my own hand? Then what are you for? Because we both know that I want to roll you to the doorstep of my enemy, wind you up, and see them blown to the wind. He sat on his bed and reclined. He lifted a cord which had been nailed to the frame of the bed. He pulled the slip knot over his head, tightening it until his airway became restricted. He lunged down, jerked, breathing like an asthmatic. He faltered and sputtered out a little strangled cough, but did not desist. Blocked arteries pulsed backwards and forwards, bulging under his skin. Muscles worked manically to free the windpipe, but to no avail. His body twisted in its panic. Fingers twitched, counting down. Four, three, two, one, zero. And again. Ten, nine, eight. Eyes opened, shifting out of focus. Fists clenched, white-knuckled with determination. Pulsing beats threw colourful phantom shapes into his vision. Ghosts danced in the pounding beat of his dying organs. Patterns, disrupted patterns. Panic, headache, sinuses bursting, gasping, panic! <laughs> the air gushed back into his hollow body as he ripped at the cord, loosened, but didn't remove it. The light wins once more. He whispered with tears in his eyes. He slept. Elizabeth sensed terrible darkness. She felt grateful to be tucked away out of sight. <laughs> 